So uh, your coagulation studies are very important. If you ever work in a hospital, you'll have a lot of patients on things like Coumadin and heparin. Um, you know, heparin's given to almost everyone in the hospital prophylactically. And then Coumadin, obviously, for um, chronic diseases like AFib and mechanical valves. Uh, your PT, uh, which is 11 to about 12.5, now this isn't tested a lot, um, but when it is, it's always tested with the INR. And the INR is what's more important um, in general. Uh, typical INR is about 0.9 to 1.2, but that's just that's for me, you, and you know, people that aren't on any anticoagulation medications. Um, people who are in Coonan for AFib, uh, the goal is usually about 2 to 3. So you want their blood um, you know, a little more thinned out. Um, it kind of reduce its ability to coagulate and to form a thrombus. So um, you want that INR to be a little higher. And same with the mechanical valve, although that you want the INR to be even higher than the AFib, and the goal is about 2.5 to 3.5, and that will stop uh, clots from forming on the mechanical valve. Here you got your uh, APTT. Uh, APTT replaced the regular PTT a uh, in most hospitals. Um, your normal will be 30 to 40 seconds. Uh, often, if you're on a heparin drip or um, you know a heparin infusion after like a myocardial infarction or a, a pulmonary embolism, you'll actually want your PTT elevated, and the goal is usually about one and a half to two and a half times the normal. So that you do the math, and you know that varies from institution to institution. There's often usually a um, a pretty intense algorithm involved in uh, many many hospitals, and you know everyone's got their own policy on that. Um, and lastly, you have your D-dimer, which is uh, below 0.5. Uh, the D-dimer is a fibrin degradation product. What this means is if you have some sort of um, thrombolytic event, say like a DVT or a uh, clot somewhere in your, you know, anywhere in your arm or somewhere in your body, then your D-dimer will be elevated. So if you see symptoms of a DVT in the leg, like you know a lot of redness, swelling, and warmth, then the uh, the D-dimer will be kind of the first thing that the the physician will use to help diagno diagnose a DVT because it's cheap and it's easy. Um, you know, if a D-dimer is elevated, then they'll almost always order an ultrasound to confirm the presence of a DVT. And next, we got a cardiac enzymes. Um, some of these aren't always important for myocardial infarction. Some of them are. Um, others are important for other things. So we'll, uh, we'll start with troponin. Uh, troponin I is the most important. It's uh, it's an enzyme used in muscle contraction, and it's very specific to cardiac muscle damage. It will often elevate within three hours of an MI or uh, you know damage to the cardiac muscle, and it can be elevated for as long as ten days. Um, but uh, we got to keep in mind that it will also be elevated for other things like heart failure and cardiomyopathy when that you know when that heart muscle is really stretched out, and also in up to forty percent of cases of sepsis, um, there will be an elevated troponin due to the stress on the heart during a, during a septic infection. Next, you got your BNP. Uh, your BNP, you won't usually want it below 100. Um, now, in an elevated BNP, um, well, first of all, BNPs are released from your ventricles when they're when they're overstretched or when they have an excessive amount of fluid in them and, and stretched. So this is often indicative of uh, fluid overload and, and heart failure. So if you have a patient come in that uh, is very edematous um, all around, they got crackles in their lungs, they got uh, jugular vein distension. You check a BNP and it's almost always elevated. So that's when you, uh, you bring out the Lasix and um, maybe some inotropic medications that help that heart, uh, you know, keep a good solid, a good strong pump to it. Um, next is your CK, which is your uh, creatine phosphokinase. You could also call it a CPK. Um, this is indicative of muscle damage. It's going to peak after about six hours. Um, there's more specific CKs you can do, like the CKMB, which is for which is specific for heart muscle. Um, this isn't as widely used as troponin. Um, um, a regular CK is often used um, during uh, something like uh, uh, systemic muscle damage, like in rhabdomyolysis. Um, they got your C-reactive protein, which is normally less than one. Um, your C-reactive protein will rise due to acute inflammation. I mean, this can be a myocardial infarction, but it also can be lots of other things like endocarditis, myocarditis, and uh, rheumatic fever. Um, so C-reactive protein is just kind of a general marker of inflammation, nothing specific. Next, you got your LEAs, or your lactate dehydrogenase. 
Um, this is also uh, a non-specific marker. It's uh, usually ind indicative of cellular damage, uh, whether it's a myocardial infarction or um, or muscle damage somewhere else. So this will often rise within one to two days. It's not um, it's not usually taken specifically for a myocardial infarction, but it uh, it is a sign of cellular damage. Um, then you got your myoglobin, which is normally less than ninety. Uh, myoglobin is actually uh, an oxygen binding protein in muscle, so this will actually this will rise due to myocardial damage within three hours, but it will also rise due to any muscle damage, you know, like skeletal muscle damage, um, such in cases of rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis is damage to the skeletal muscle. Um, you know, a lot of times, <coughs> a lot of times we'll find somebody that's been down for a few days and, and, and you know couldn't get up for a variety of reasons. They will, they'll often you know with the spot they're relying on will cause severe muscle damage and um, cause rhabdomyolysis. And we'll often do a myoglobin or a CK study, and you know those are always elevated in those in those situations.